Apollo 1, 1967. Apollo 1 was supposed to be a routine test. Instead, it ended with three astronauts trapped in flames. On January 27, 1967, the crew of Apollo 1 entered their spacecraft for what should have been a simple ground rehearsal. But within minutes, that test turned into one of NASA's darkest tragedies. The mission was meant to be the first crewed flight of the Apollo program, the project that would eventually put humans on the moon. The launch was set for the following month on a Saturn IB rocket from Cape Kennedy. Its purpose was straightforward. Orbit Earth, test the systems, and prepare for the bigger missions ahead. But during that test, with the cabin sealed and filled with pure oxygen, a single spark was all it took to ignite disaster. Nine seconds after a small voltage surge, a voice suddenly shouted over the comms. Fire! In an instant, flames tore through the Apollo 1 cabin, fueled by pure oxygen and the flammable materials inside. Smoke and heat filled the tiny capsule within seconds. Pressure built so quickly that the hatch jammed shut, leaving the astronauts with no way out. Ground crews ran to the rescue, but the inward opening hatch slowed everything down. By the time they finally broke inside, it was too late. Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee were gone. Lost not in space, but during a simple ground test. The investigation exposed a deadly mix of mistakes. A cabin pressurized with pure oxygen, nylon and Velcro everywhere, no real emergency plan, and a hatch that trapped the crew instead of saving them. It wasn't just one flaw. It was a chain reaction waiting to happen. As an aftermath, NASA grounded the Apollo program for nearly two years. Engineers tore the capsule apart and rebuilt it with non-flammable materials, safer wiring, a quick-release hatch, and a redesigned atmosphere system. Apollo 1 nearly ended the dream of reaching the moon. But instead, its tragedy forced the changes that made Apollo 7 possible and eventually carried astronauts all the way to the lunar surface. Space Shuttle Challenger, 1986. 73 seconds after liftoff, millions watching on live television saw a dream turn into a fireball. On January 28, 1986, millions of people watched the Space Shuttle Challenger lift off. The mission carried seven astronauts, a satellite, plans to study Halley's Comet, and Krista McAuliffe, a teacher who had captured the world's attention. It was a launch filled with hope and inspiration, until 73 seconds later, when it turned into tragedy. At first, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. But Florida's morning that day was unusually cold, only 36 degrees Fahrenheit, and that cold would prove fatal. The rubber O-rings in the right solid rocket booster had stiffened in the freezing air and failed to seal the joints. Through that tiny gap, scorching gases leaked out, and a jet of flame began burning into the external fuel tank and the strut that held the booster in place. Within seconds, the damage was unstoppable. Heat tore through critical structures. The booster broke free, the external tank collapsed, and Challenger ripped apart 46,000 feet above the Atlantic. In less than two minutes, the mission was gone, and so were all seven astronauts. The investigation that followed revealed two painful truths. Technically, the O-rings had failed under cold conditions. They simply weren't designed to handle that temperature. But deeper than that, it was a failure of management. Engineers had warned against launching in such cold weather, yet those warnings were brushed aside. Schedule and public pressure outweighed safety, and the cost was catastrophic. NASA paused the shuttle program for nearly three years, redesigned the booster joints, improved materials, and overhauled decision-making processes. Challenger became a hard-learned lesson etched into history. Ignore warnings, normalize risks, and even the most advanced machines can come apart in seconds. 17 years later, history would test whether those lessons had truly been learned. This time, the danger didn't come at liftoff. It hid in the smallest detail during launch, waiting patiently for re-entry. That was the story of Columbia. Space Shuttle Columbia, 2003. The morning seemed calm until the sky over Texas and Louisiana lit up with streaks of fire. On February 1, 2003, Space Shuttle Columbia was returning from 16 days in orbit. But instead of landing safely, it broke apart high in the atmosphere, scattering debris for miles and taking the lives of all seven astronauts on board. Columbia's mission, STS-107, had launched from Kennedy Space Center on January 16th. It carried dozens of experiments, like life sciences, material studies, and even projects designed by students. For 16 days, everything went as planned. But the real danger had started long before re-entry. Just 82 seconds after liftoff, a chunk of foam insulation broke off the external fuel tank and struck Columbia's left wing. The impact punched a hole in the thermal protection system. Engineers raised concerns, but their warnings never reached those making the decisions. So when Columbia re-entered Earth's atmosphere, 
The outcome was inevitable. Heat reaching thousands of degrees poured into the damaged wing, tearing through wiring, hydraulics, and structure. Sensors failed. Controls went silent. The wing disintegrated, and within moments, Columbia was gone. The investigation confirmed the foam strike as the cause, but it also revealed deeper problems, a culture that downplayed risks and ignored warnings. NASA grounded the shuttle program for over two years, improving inspections, adding new safety checks, and overhauling communication. But the danger of flight has never been limited to shuttles. Long before Columbia, another machine was already testing the edge of space. X-15 Flight 1967 The fastest rocket plane ever flown by a human suddenly spun out of control and exploded in a fireball right on the edge of space. But what actually went wrong? On November 15, 1967, the experimental North American X-15 rocket plane, Flight 191, was dropped from its NB-52B mothership over Edwards Air Force Base. Its mission? Climbed to 266,000 feet, far above NASA's line for space. At the controls was Major Michael J. Adams, flying his seventh X-15 mission. Everything looked normal at first, but shortly after ignition, an electrical glitch interfered with the flight controls. Adams pressed on reaching peak altitude and performing a planned horizon scanning maneuver. That's when things started to slip. The X-15 drifted off course, and as it re-entered denser air, it was caught in an uncontrollable spin at nearly Mach 5. Adams fought desperately, switching between manual controls and reaction jets, but the plane entered a violent, inverted dive. At Mach 4.7, control systems oscillated wildly, slamming the craft with brutal forces, 15G vertically, 8G sideways. By 65,000 feet, the X-15 was tearing itself apart. Seconds later, it disintegrated, killing Adams instantly. Investigators pieced together the cause from wreckage and cockpit footage. A chain of problems, electrical disturbance, weakened controls, possible disorientation, and misread instruments. Adams was overwhelmed by conditions no pilot had ever faced. Flight 191 was the only X-15 ever lost. But the lessons from that tragedy reshaped the future of high-speed, high-altitude flight. T-38 Jet Theodore Freeman 1964 One bird, one crack of plexiglass. And just like that, a rising astronaut's future was gone. On October 31, 1964, NASA astronaut Captain Theodore C. Ted Freeman was flying a NASA-modified T-38A Talon jet trainer, heading back to Ellington Air Force Base in Houston after a routine training trip. The T-38 was sleek, fast and trusted by NASA pilots. For Freeman, it was supposed to be just another touch-and-go practice run. Everything seemed normal until the final approach. Then, out of nowhere, a lesser snow goose slammed into the cockpit canopy. The plexiglass shattered instantly, spraying shards and debris into the engines. Investigators later found feathers, blood, and fragments of the canopy scattered miles from the crash site. In seconds, both engines flamed out. Freeman had no thrust, no options. He had maybe five seconds. Too low to glide, too close to eject safely. He aimed for an open field to spare nearby homes, dropped the landing gear, and tried to escape. But at just 100 feet, the ejection seat didn't have time. His parachute never opened. The investigation confirmed what happened. The bird strike had blasted through the canopy, feeding debris into both engines and shutting them down instantly. Freeman never stood a chance once the engines died. Astronaut James Lovell, who sat on the review board, later noted that the chain of events unfolded faster than any pilot could react. Ted Freeman's death was the first fatal accident in NASA's astronaut corps. It showed that even the best pilots, flying the most advanced jets, could still be undone by something as small and unexpected as a bird. But sometimes, it isn't nature that strikes. It's judgment. Just two years later, another T-38 would fall from the sky. This time, not from a bird in the engines, but from a decision made in the fog. T-38 Jet, Elliot C. and Charles Bassett, 1966. On a fog-shrouded morning, two astronauts disappeared into the mist. What mistake turned a routine flight into a disaster? On February 28, 1966, NASA command pilot Elliot M. C. Jr. and pilot Charles A. Bassett II, the prime crew for Gemini 9, climbed into a sleek T-38A Talon trainer. They were heading from Ellington Air Force Base to St. Louis for two weeks of rendezvous simulator training at McDonnell Aircraft, the same company assembling their spacecraft. The trip was meant to be uneventful, but as they neared Lambert Field, the weather closed in. Rain, fog, and low ceilings reduced visibility, and both T-38s in the group overshot their initial approach. Seed tried again, choosing a visual circling maneuver. In the poor conditions, he descended too low. 
He lit the afterburner and banked hard left to line up for the runway. It was too late. The jet's wing clipped the roof of McDonald's Building 101, the very place where their Gemini capsule was being built. The T-38 spun into a courtyard and erupted in flames. C died still strapped to his ejection seat, parachute half deployed. Bassett suffered fatal injuries on impact, his body thrown into the rafters of the factory. A NASA panel, led by astronaut Alan Shepard, sifted through the wreckage and weather reports. They considered maintenance, air traffic control, and training. The verdict was clear, pilot error in low visibility conditions. C had flown too low, and the gamble ended in tragedy. But not every fall from the sky came from human error. Sometimes the danger wasn't in a pilot's judgment. It was buried inside the machine itself, waiting to strike. T-38 Jet, Clifton Williams, 1967. In a dive faster than fear, a hidden fault ended the journey of an astronaut once destined for the moon. On October 5, 1967, Major Clifton C. Williams, a Marine Corps pilot and NASA astronaut, climbed into his T-38A jet trainer for a quick flight from Cape Canaveral to Mobile, Alabama, hoping to visit his sick father. The T-38 was sleek, fast, and built for demanding missions. For Williams, it was just another trip before returning to Apollo training. But at 22,000 feet over northern Florida, everything went wrong. The jet's ailerons jammed, locking the flight controls. The aircraft snapped into a violent roll and pitched nose down into a steep dive. Within seconds, the sharp trainer became uncontrollable. The descent was terrifying. Inverted and nearly at the speed of sound, the jet plunged through pine forest, scorching trees with its exhaust but never striking them. Williams pulled the ejection handle at roughly 1,500 feet. At that speed and altitude, the system simply couldn't work in time. His parachute barely deployed before the aircraft shattered on impact. Williams was killed instantly. Investigators traced the crash to a mechanical failure deep in the flight control system. With the ailerons jammed, no pilot, no matter how skilled, could have wrestled the jet back to safety. The review called for stricter inspections and closer attention to maintenance so future crews wouldn't face the same hidden trap. For NASA, the loss was crushing. Williams had been slated for an Apollo crew assignment, his path pointing straight toward the moon. To honor him, Apollo 12's patch carried a small fourth star, symbolizing his place among them. Training Accident, 1967. He was America's first African-American astronaut in training. And then, in an instant, everything was lost. On December 8, 1967, Major Robert H. Lawrence Jr. settled into the back seat of a Lockheed F-104 starfighter at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Just months earlier, he had made history as the first African-American selected for any national space program. That afternoon, he was with fellow pilot Major Harvey Royer. Their task was to practice steep descent glides, demanding maneuvers meant to mirror how a spacecraft would return to Earth. At first, the flight seemed routine. But during the descent, Royer pulled up too late. The jet slammed down with brutal force, its landing gear snapping on impact. The canopy shattered, sparks flew, and within seconds the starfighter was skidding across the runway with fire trailing behind it. Royer ejected upward and lived through the crash with injuries. Lawrence wasn't as fortunate. His ejection system launched him sideways instead of up. At such a low altitude, his parachute barely had time to open before he struck the ground still strapped to his seat. He died instantly. The investigation found the late flare caused the landing gear collapse and crash. What should have been a calculated training exercise had turned into tragedy, made worse by an ejection system that left no margin for error. Lawrence's death was more than personal. It was historic. He wasn't just a gifted pilot. He was also a scholar with a PhD in chemistry and a vital part of the Air Force's manned orbiting laboratory program. His loss meant the world never saw him take the next step into space, despite the barrier he had already broken simply by being chosen. Decades later, his legacy was finally recognized. In 1997, his name was inscribed on the Astronauts Memorial Foundation's Space Mirror, a lasting tribute to his promise and sacrifice. X-15, Test Flight Support, 1966 Formation flying can look like poetry in the sky until one slip turns it into disaster. On June 8, 1966, Captain Joseph A. Joe Walker, NASA's chief research test pilot and the first man to fly into space twice, climbed into a Lockheed F-104N Starfighter. He was part of a publicity photo flight, soaring in tight formation with the massive experimental XB-70 Valkyrie bomber, while chase planes captured the spectacle high above Barstow, California. For a while, Everything seemed routine. Then, without warning, 
Walker's F-104 was sucked into the Valkyrie's wingtip vortex. The turbulence tossed the smaller jet upward and straight into the bomber's wing. The impact was instant and catastrophic. The F-104 exploded and the Valkyrie lost its vertical fins. In just seconds, the skies turned violent. Walker's plane disintegrated, killing him instantly. The Valkyrie managed to stay level for 16 agonizing seconds before flipping, crashing, and killing its co-pilot, Major Carl S. Cross. Only pilot Alvin S. White survived, ejecting with severe injuries. Investigators later found the cause, the starfighter's fatal encounter with the Valkyrie's wake turbulence. But they also uncovered deeper issues like poor coordination, inadequate planning, and approval shortcuts for what was meant to be a showpiece flight. Under normal rules, that risky formation never should have been cleared. For NASA, losing Joe Walker was a devastating blow. He was a pioneer, the only X-15 pilot to reach space twice, flying higher than 62 miles above Earth. His death led to stricter safety rules for formation flying, but it also proved something far harsher. In the sky, seconds can decide everything.